Good afternoon, everybody. Um, it's a great honour for me to be here uh, after such a kind and flattering introduction uh, here in Latvia. I was here briefly in uh, May at the invitation of the Patent Office to participate in an interesting uh, WIPO uh, co-organised seminar, uh, but was here only very briefly, so it's marvellous to be able to see this incredible uh, Latvian coastline here. So often we spend our time in hotel rooms in artificial light, and this is, this is marvellous. <laughs> but anyway, um, my subject is not the, the landscape of Latvia, but uh, the protection of authors' rights. Uh, I'm going to talk, uh, just introduce you to WIPO momentarily. Then I'm going to remind you about the basic principles of copyright. Then I'd like to talk for a few minutes about the nature of infringement and why we care about it. Uh, and then finally I would like to get into some contemporary or near contemporary decisions, in particular of the Court of Justice of the European Union, uh, and probably then I'll run out of time. So let's see how we go. Good. Now, before I talk about this slide, I should tell you that the World Intellectual Property Organization uh, is an organization which is part of the United Nations system. It dates from 1967 when uh, a, an international treaty brought WIPO into existence. But the roots of WIPO go right back into the 19th century to the Paris Convention on Industrial Property of 1883 and the Berne Convention on copyright or author's rights of 1886. Those two treaties had a small secretariat to administer them, and over the years that uh, the responsibilities of that secretariat increased. They moved from Bern to Geneva, I think in 1960, and as of today, in addition to our own treaty, the treaty which brought us into existence, we managed 25 intellectual property treaties ranging from the Patent Cooperation Treaty to the uh, Beijing Treaty on the Rights of Audiovisual Performers. And we continue to work towards new treaties, though in the modern environment that is a very difficult thing to do. So that's WIPO, and the Berne Convention is one of our fundamental texts, if I can put it that way, and that protects the subject matter of my talk this afternoon. Now, some of you know a lot about copyright and some of you know a little bit less, so perhaps you'll forgive me if I just, uh, in three slides, remind us of the basic principles. Copyright is a property right which protects original creative works in the literary and artistic domain, and that expression is construed very widely to include uh, books, music, buildings, pictures and sculpture, photographs, maps, software. Probably software is the most valuable copyright protected work today uh, on which so much of commerce depends. What is original? Well, in the European Union, what is original is uh, a work which is its author's own intellectual creation, whatever that means. There has to be some element of originality, some spark of personal creativity that you can detect in the work. A, a simple photograph of a holiday beach might or might not qualify. Um, this is a field which is not completely harmonized, but that is, in principle, the test of originality. Copyright provides exclusive rights over the use of a work, and the first owner is typically the author or, for a film, uh, the producer. Uh, the producer and the director, strictly speaking, but in, in practical terms, the producer will be the, the owner. The duration for most works is uh, life plus 70 years. Under the Berne Convention, the minimum is life plus 50 years, but in Europe we have uh, a, a longer protection. Most importantly for judges uh, is to remember that copyright is a territorial right, so that the copyright in Latvia is a distinct right from the copyright in Poland, let's say. Even though they are harmonised to a very great extent in the European Union, they remain national rights, unlike the community design or the European design, for example, which is a community-wide, union-wide right. And finally... 
uh, the rights of the right holder are limited by certain exceptions in favour of either uses of works which are too minor to be the subject of licensing, realistically, such as private uses, or socially beneficial uses, such as education or criticism, which are thought to override the importance of the artist's or the, the author's rights. And finally, the rights are divided into two categories. There are economic rights, which are the rights that are exploited by distributors, people who sell things, people who license things. And those rights are typically uh, capable of being bought and sold or at least being licensed to substantially the same effect. Uh, and then there are so-called moral rights, which are rights that inhere, in some sense, in the personality of the author. And those are the rights which protect his right to be named as the author, or not to be named, if he now hates his work, or perhaps more as importantly, um, the right to object to a derogatory treatment of his work. That's, these are all rights that come very much from the civil law tradition of which Latvia forms part. They are reflected in the Berne Convention, but it took some common law countries like my own, the United Kingdom, a very long time to recognize them. Now those rights, in, normally speaking, can, uh, cannot be bought and sold. They can be inherited, and in some systems they're enforced by the heirs of the author, and they can be waived, but they cannot be bought and sold. And finally, my, my main topic is enforcement today. I'm not concerned with issues of collective management or uh, transactions. I'm talking about respect for intellectual property, for enforcement, and a key element of the international uh, framework for copyright is a series of treaties, all of which uh, recognize the principle of national treatment. So that uh, because Latvia is a member of the Berne Convention and the United Kingdom is a member of the Berne Convention, authors from Latvia are respected, their rights are respected in the United Kingdom as if they were United Kingdom nationals and vice versa, United Kingdom authors are recognized in Latvia in exactly the same way as if they were Latvian nationals. And this principle of, na of international protection of national treatment is crucially important to the existence of an international market in copyright-protected works, such as music, film, software, books, you name it. Why do we care about copyright? Well, among the many very valuable statistics compiled by the European Union Intellectual Property Office, there is a recent survey of the size of the so-called copyright intensive industries. That's a WIPO concept uh, adopted by EU IPO. And the EU IPO measured the role that these industries play in the economies of the countries of the European Union. And uh, if we look at Latvia, we see that over 5% of total employment in Latvia depends on the copyright intensive industries and nearly 7% of the gross domestic product. So it's a not insignificant part of the economy. And so from a purely um, commercial, economic perspective, we can see that copyright is important and I note that Latvia is very much uh, around the average level uh, in the European Union. Now, technology has brought many benefits, of course, to modern life, but with it, it has brought many problems for intellectual property, especially for copyright. Uh, the, this this uh, article relates to a rather distasteful uh, spectacle uh, of a, a, a boxing match which took place uh, earlier this year. Uh, and this match was commercialized through pay television. So people would pay for the right to, to, right to watch the boxing match as it was happening, live television. And uh, I think that they sold maybe six million views, six million subscriptions to this one-off event. But people who had not paid for the right to watch the match numbered 132 million. 
132 million views. Now, even if only 5% of those people would have paid for the chance to watch, you can see the economic consequences are absolutely immense. And sport is probably the most um, important contemporary issue when it comes to copyright protection because the value of sports rights is immense, especially for football. Um, a couple of years ago, the Premier League rights in the UK were sold for £6 billion. Pounds. And that money is not just for wealthy footballers, of course. It trickles all the way down to the amateur level. And sport is an important part of our culture. To say nothing of film and music and all the rest of it, uh, live entertainment is now a target of enormous amounts of piracy. And this interesting map from a technology provider uh, gives you some notion of the spread of these 132 million people. And the red dots indicate where the streams were coming from. The blue dots indicate where they were being consumed. And there's obviously technology now which makes it very easy for me to stream live uh, broadcasts to the world. It's very difficult, of course, to calculate costs and losses. Attempts are made from time to time. This report was prepared for the International Trademarks Association and the Business Alliance Against Cop um, Counterfeiting and Piracy. And uh, one of the things that I pick out of it was that there were nearly 50 billion illegal movie downloads in 2015. 50 billion. It's, uh, it's just staggering. And the problem is we've, we've brought up a generation which thinks that culture essentially is free, that we don't have to pay for things. Um, and unfortunately, that is very uh, damaging. Another way of looking at the problem is to look at how much of the internet bandwidth, how much of the data passing through the internet uh, is um, related to infringing activities. This very detailed report from 2013 is probably still the best um, picture we have of online piracy. And at that time, at least, nearly a quarter of the bandwidth uh, on the internet was being consumed by pirate activity. Of course, games, films, software, these occupy a, a lot of space. They're very heavy data objects, so naturally they use a lot of space. But it's pretty staggering that this facility, which has changed our lives so much, should be so much used by um, piracy. And of course, there are any number of other illegal activities that it facilitates. Finally, there is an important consumer protection aspect to the protection of copyright, and in particular in relation to malware, um, computer viruses and so forth. This um, paper was sponsored by Microsoft. Um, they carried out a test of websites downloading um, pirate copies of software, and then they found that in about a th slightly more than a third of the time, that the software they downloaded contained... Um, malicious adware or viruses of one sort or another. So it's, it's a jungle out there. It's very dangerous uh, and le leaving quite aside the, the economic consequences. So I guess we all care a fair bit about copyright enforcement, but what is the problem that we're addressing? How does copyright get infringed on the internet? Now, of course, there are still plenty of old-fashioned copyright infringement cases. We've still got books being copied, songs being copied, and so forth. But as a mass phenomenon in the developed world, we're largely talking about the internet. The old days of the pirated DVD, which used to be so common in England. Everybody had a story in the 2000s. I was sitting in a pizza restaurant in London. Someone came in, tried to sell me pirate DVD. That's all been killed by the internet. So um, those unfortunate business people have had to find another occupation. So let me talk about piracy on the internet. One kind of piracy that we see are so-called direct download sites. This is a website, and behind the website there is a computer server, quite simply storing pirated copies of uh, entertainment products or software. For films, these are very often shot using a video camera from the back of a cinema. 
The first time a film appears on the pirate networks, it will very often have been filmed in this way. Um, obviously, the quality is not quite so good, but you're not paying for it, so maybe you don't mind. The way in which these sites work is rather obviously that you have a user at home who wants to get a free copy of Star Wars. You have a website with a series of links. And associated with the website, you have a server. Now, the server might actually be operated by the website owner, or it might be a so-called cyber locker. And I'll talk about that uh, in a moment. That's a, a website that's operated as a storage facility by a third party. And very simply, you go to the website, you click on the link, and then that link puts you in touch with the server, which contains the pirated content, and it simply is downloaded to your computer or streamed uh, live, as it were. Now, what is a cyber locker? There are some online storage facilities which are completely legitimate. When I sent my presentation to Inguna, uh, it's a very heavy presentation. So I uploaded it to Dropbox, which is an, uh, an authentic, genuine uh, storage facility. I got a link from, Lockbox, uh, from Dropbox, which I sent to Inguna, and she just clicked on the link and was able to download this very large presentation to her computer in Latvia. So I didn't have to try and send an enormous email to her, which probably would have been blocked. Now, there have been, and I think there still are, storage facilities with a more malicious intent. This was a classic mega upload. This was the biggest of these pirate cyber lockers. And quite simply, it's a place where you can store digital content. You can't tell, you can't access the content directly from the cyber locker just by visiting the website. What happens is the cyber locker issues you with a link. And that link allows anyone who clicks the link to access the content which you have uploaded to the cyber locker. And this particular cyber locker, like others, incentivized people to upload infringing content. Why? Because the cyber locker wants people to buy. Uh, premium access to its services. And of course, the more attractive material the CyberLocker can offer, the more attractive its service and the higher the price and the larger the number of members paying the price. So the way in which this, this was operated by a German chap called Kim Schmitz, a very extraordinary person who made literally millions of euros uh, out of this, uh, this system, in 2012, he was arrested in New Zealand, where he was living, at the request of the, um, the FBI, and he's been fighting uh, his extradition ever since, but I dare say eventually he will find himself in the United States. Anyway, the way it works, as I say, is that you suppose that I have a copy of the film. I might have a, an advanced copy of a DVD that's about to be released, or I might have gone to the cinema and filmed from the back of the cinema or I may have somehow stolen uh, a copy of software, let's say. I want to make it available. I upload that data to the CyberLocker. The CyberLocker then sends me a link, and I can put that link in an email, on a website, in a chat, internet chat room, uh, whatever. Let's say in this case I put it up on a website, like the one that I first talked about. Then we have a series of consumers who are interested in getting a free copy, they go to the website, they click on the link, and their computers are thereby directed to the right spot in the storage facility, and they download the work. So now everybody's got a copy, and probably nobody paid for it. Now you see in this discussion how the uh, legal uh, issues emerge, that we have copies that are being made, so that infringes the reproduction right under copyright. We have copies being made available to uh, the public, which infringes, in principle, infringes the communication to the public right. And the vector, the method by which these acts take place, is linking. 
So the legal significance of linking is clearly very important, and uh, if there's time, I hope I will get to some cases about it. Social media, of course, is an endless theme in the newspapers these days and on the media. This is increasingly uh, the method by which IP infringers of all kinds, including vendors of counterfeit goods, uh, reach their publics. You wouldn't think that this was an illegal site, but in fact it is. It's offering uh, streaming uh, of live sport. Typically, a live uh, a streaming site like Rojo Director, very famous pirate streaming site, will offer a series of links. You see all of these are links, and there's a text which relates the, the, the link to a live sport event, and it tells you when it's going to be. So if you fancy watching, let's say, the handball uh, women's playoffs in Bucharest at 6 o'clock, then you click on the link, and it's very similar to the, to the, uh, the streaming, to the, the download site, except that in this case, you've got someone with a legitimate subscription to a pay TV site, so it might be Sky or whatever it is. You have a video capture card, which is a very elementary piece of hardware, and you connect to a streaming server, which is a computer that's set up so that it can receive a lot of requests for, for the download or streaming of data. And then simply I go to the website, I click on the link, and then the program plays to me live or almost live. This is what the setup might well look at like. This is a, a raid in the north of England at the, in the latter part of 2014. And you see that there, there's a computer under each of these screens. Each of these, I imagine, represents a, an individual subscription. And of course, you can sell this service as well. You can, you can offer subscriptions. Now, at the, at the moment, the problem of online streaming has moved to some extent, to these so-called Kodi boxes. This is a, a kind of set-top box, which in itself is perfectly innocuous. But you can load it with apps, with applications, which uh, are effectively permanent links to uh, illegal streaming services. So you, you get this box uh, for a small amount. This is 60 pounds, so like... Um, 70, 80 euros. Um, it's already loaded with these applications, these, these links to pirate services. You connect it to your digital TV, your internet-enabled TV, and hey presto, you can now watch uh, films, live sport, and so forth without paying any more for them. And this is a very tricky problem because you can't say there's anything wrong with the box in itself. The technology is perfectly legal. What makes it a problem is that it's already loaded with a certain amount of software. And the courts have begun to uh, deal with this, at least in the UK. Um, if you sell a box that's actually got the, the pirate apps on it, you may well find yourself going to prison. The problem that we haven't quite tackled everywhere is where people with a nod and a wink know what you can do with the boxes, and they're sold without the pirate apps. That's more subtle. F for complete, now I was going to leave this one out, but I think it is still a problem potentially in this part of the world. Another way in which television is pirated is a thing called card sharing. And to some extent, the apps are taking over from that, but card sharing still appears to, to happen. What you need is a special generic set-top box like this one, this is called a dream box. Um, and again, there's nothing wrong with the box. It's an innocent piece of technology. But it can be programmed with certain software, which means that you can do card sharing. And I'm going to explain how that works. This is an advert I saw the other day, or a website I saw the other day, uh, explaining how for a modest subscription, um, 20 euros a month or whatever it is, uh, you can uh, get all the service from via Sat Baltic, for example. Uh, so instead of paying the satellite company, you pay a bit of money to this mysterious person on the internet who uh, is quite hard to identify from his website. To, to me, this technology is very interesting. <laughs> That's not a legal point. I'll see whether you agree. Now, satellite television 
obviously is, is typically encrypted so that it's coming down on us, but not all of us are willing to pay for it. So only the people who pay for it are allowed to decrypt it. And they do so using a smart card. Now, if your dream box has been set up with this readily available software, then you are able to access the, uh, the programs and distribute them. The way it works is that the code, the, 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 the code that unlocks the broadcast travels with the broadcast. It comes down from the satellite. But in order to un use the code, you have, to, you have to decrypt it using a smart card, which is, only, which is personal to you. I've subscribed to the service, so I get the smart card. And that's normally fine. But what this software does is it allows you to intercept the decrypted code word and share it with other people over the internet. They have the same box. So, I hope this makes sense. I pay, I pay Mr. Pirate a bit of money, a lot less than I would pay to Viasat. And then he shares with me the decrypted code word every 10 seconds or so. And so now I can watch the program as well. But all I've had to do is to pay him for the code word rather than them much more for the programming. Now, what's interesting to me about this from a legal perspective is that there's, n there's no copying going on. Or debatably, there isn't, isn't really any copying. What's happening is this is the genuine signal. This is the real article. It's coming from the, from the right holder. But what's been taken is the key to the encryption. And that's why, since 1996, the international legal framework has incorporated the requirement that we protect technological protection measures. And that's reflected in the European directives as well. And uh, this is, has been a massive problem. These people were sent to prison for quite a long time a few years ago in the north of England. As I say, their business probably will be replaced over time by the app people. And finally, uh, I'd like to just tell you about peer-to-peer -peer downloading, because we we hear an enormous amount about it, and it's, it's quite interesting. Now, who's heard of the Pirate Bay? Anyone heard of the Pirate Bay? No? Oh, I'm glad to hear it, um, because the Pirate Bay is one of the biggest pirate sites on the internet. Um, this is a, a, a typical BitTorrent site. These look like links. They're not quite links. They're, they're torrent files, or links to torrent files. Peer-to-peer -peer downloading solves a particular problem. Remember I said that I, I wanted to send my, my presentation to Inguna, and it was like 20 million megabytes. Um, if I was sending that from my computer to you in an email, or trying to send it to you, I'd need enormous bandwidth. And as a consumer, I, I wouldn't want to pay for that. However, if I use this peer-to-peer -peer system, I can get over the bandwidth problem by breaking the work up into a lot of pieces and sen sending the individual pieces across uh, and doing it collectively with a lot of other people. That so probably sounds a bit mysterious, but let me explain. You, you download client software to your computer, so your computer can participate in a conversation with other people who have the same software peer-to-peer -peer software. These links, or these torrents, identify a particular pirate copy. They contain a so-called a hash value. That's a, that's a computer-generated identifier, which allows you to identify a particular copy of a film, let's say, or software, as being that copy. The software then breaks up the, uh, the work into many pieces. And as long as one person has a copy of this work, the rest of us can get it without using a lot of bandwidth. The way it works is like this. I'm at home, and I want to get a copy of a work. I go to the, a website, for example, where I can identify that there is a pirate copy. I get the torrent file, and then my software asks everybody else, have you got this, or have you got any of this, any part of this? And this process is sometimes coordinated by a so-called tracker site. 
such as the Pirate Bay. And this site keeps tags on who's got what, who's downloading what, but they don't themselves have a copy of the work. So here's the copyright question. If they don't have a copy of the work, how are they infringing? And that's a problem that the courts have had to think about. But let's go back to the user. I want to copy the work. I ask everybody else, have you got this work or have you got part of it? And someone, someone will say, yes, I got part of it. And then they start to download it to, to me. And automatically, I start to upload it to everybody else. So finally, the work is flying about in little pieces about damn thin pipes to all these different users. It's, a bit, it's as if I had a book, like a Bible, uh, of a thousand pages, and I wanted to get it through your letterbox. I, it, I couldn't get it through because it's too thick. But if I had simply, all the pages are numbered, and I just tore them out and put them through one by one, I could, and you'd just put them together again, and then you'd have the whole book. And that's exactly how this works, because all the pieces are numbered. And so everybody can share little bits. And the, and the more people who are sharing, the more efficient it is. So it's, it's a very remarkable solution to that problem, and it remains probably a quarter of the, the, uh, the piracy problem, if not more. One important thing it's important for you to know, I think, as judges, is that everybody who is connected to the internet uh, has a kind of a phone number, a so-called IP address, because all, obviously all the machines have to be able to identify one another. Uh, every website has one or more IP addresses, and these addresses are visible to someone who is participating in the swarm, as they call it, in the conversation. Because obviously my machine has to know where your machine is, otherwise we won't be able to share the pieces. Now these um, addresses are allocated to internet service providers. Each access provider has a block of addresses which he can allocate to his customers. Now, these addresses may be static, that's to say they don't change, or they may be dynamic, that's to say they change from time to time. But it doesn't matter because, normally speaking, the internet service provider will know to which of its accounts it allocated an IP address at a particular time on a particular day. So that if you, if you're if a, 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 a right holder or the police go to an, an internet service provider and say, who had this address at 2 o'clock on, on the 10th of, or the 11th of, uh, of September, the, right, the uh, internet service provider will at least be able to say, well, that was the account of Thomas Dillon at this address in London. And you can go and ask him, well, let's have a look at your computer what were you doing? So this is a very important investigative element. And uh, the Pirate Bay, uh, I had, uh, in my time in the private sector, I had the good fortune to be involved in the prosecution of the Pirate Bay in Sweden. And uh, it was the first major international case where um, the operators of a, a tracker site, a coordinating site, were sent to prison for participating in infringement. And as I say, the, that BitTorrent piracy, the file sharing as well, it's, it's more than 40%. Streaming, that's live playing from websites, is a similar amount. And then you've got other bits and pieces. Now, the legal framework in the EU for enforcement, which is my, my topic today, is principally to be found in the 2004 Directive on Enforcement, in the Regulation on Customs, that is more a matter for these days for counterfeits uh, and uh, GIs. Uh, in the old, I mean, 10 years ago, well, 12 years ago, there was enormous traffic in pirate DVDs. That's pretty much gone now. Uh, so my main topic is 2004. And then finally, uh, Article 8.3 of the 2001 Directive on Copyright, because that article provides for the grant of injunctions against intermediaries, such as internet service providers. Now, I'm not going to pretend to tell you anything about uh, the law in Latvia, but I believe that these are at least the most important um, provisions dealing with the substance of copyright, the civil process, criminal offences, and administrative offences. Uh, and um, anyway, you'll, you'll know better than I about that. 
When we talk about civil actions, of course, we have various different remedies, an injunction, damages award, claims for information, uh, and interestingly, site-blocking injunctions against the service providers. In the criminal field, of course, there are offences, but increasingly, uh, enforcement authorities are actually blocking websites by seizing domain names, uh, and uh, I've mentioned customs. And finally, there are voluntary measures uh, where, um, for example, the European Union has uh, organized a mem memorandum of understanding uh, among um, um, brand holders uh, under which they agree not to place advertising for their products on pirate websites. There's much that can be done in the voluntary field, but obviously there is no substitute for enforcement. Now, the principal right which is implicated by online piracy is the communication to the public right. This is provided for in the 1996 treaty, copyright treaty uh, of WIPO, of which Latvia is a member, and uh, is uh, uh, implemented, as it were, in the 2001 Copyright Directive. And quite simply, it's one of the exclusive rights of the author or the copyright holder to authorise the communication to the public of their works by wire or wireless means, including the making available to the public of their works in such a way that members of the public may access them from a place and at a time individually chosen by them. That final clause was the principal innovation of the treaty because it covers what you might call elective access. Something is available on a website, I may download it, I may not download it, but nonetheless, whether I do or not, there is uh, an infringement if that making available is not authorised. And the case law, which has poured out of the uh, European Court of Justice over the last few years, it seems to centre around two principal environments. First of all, hotels, weirdly, and the internet. And the main questions that are being asked are, what is the public when we talk about communication to the public? And secondly, when is linking an infringement? Uh, I know that um, my, the distinguished speaker who follows me will be talking about uh, the liability or non-liability of uh, internet service providers. I do not cover that point. I have to go back all the way to 2006 with the Rafael Hoteles case. There are lots of these cases in the European Court of Justice about television in hotel rooms. And the, the, the classic case is this one. Uh, the hotel had TVs in the rooms and a common aerial. The collecting society... Um, wanted to levy a license fee from the hotel for communicating its members' works to the public. It argued that people who came to the hotel were the public. The hotel said, well, wait a moment. Um, there's probably only one person in the hotel room watching one television. That's not the public. That's just one person. Uh, and the court said, well, yes, it is, because... Um, people can come and go, and we don't just think about all the people who are absorbing the work at one moment. We have to think about the succession of people who will access. And so you, the hotel, had to pay a license because you were communicating the work to the public. And this case is important because you see in the emphasised line, it says that the act of the hotel is an independent act through which the broadcast work is communicated to a new public. And the meaning of those words has been thrashed out and is still being thrashed out in the, in the court. The, the, the public were defined as a fairly large number of persons. As lawyers, we like to be precise, and so the expression a fairly large number is not very satisfactory, but that is the test. And... The act of the hotel is an intervention, the, in the uh, emphasised bit, that 
the hotel is the organisation which intervenes in full knowledge of the consequences of its action to give access to the protected work to its customers. So those two concepts, the intervention and the public, make up the communication to the public right. This, however, has led to a number of complications. I jump forward now to 2014, to the age of the internet. Some journalists put articles up on the website of a Swedish newspaper in Gothenburg. Someone else, Retriever Media, linked to that website. And the journalist said, we only authorised the Gothenburg newspaper to make our works available. We did not authorise you, Retriever Media, to link to this article. Uh, uh, it's an act of communication. Your intervention with the link brings our work to a public, therefore it's infringement. Uh, I know there's a lot of text in these slides. Um, that's, I hope that'll be useful to you afterwards. I'm not going to, to read it all out. And the court very simply said, it is not an infringement. The, 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 the offering of a link was a communication, but it was not to a new public. Because these articles, anyone could read these articles on the Gothenburg website. Uh, and so, so the people who were envisaged by the copyright holders when they allowed the works to be put on the website was the whole internet, everybody, the public. So by linking to it, Retriever had not added anything. They had just made it available to the same people. So there was no infringement because there was no communication to a new public. However, the court said, if there is a, uh, something that prevents general access, for example, suppose there's a password, you only get access to the, to the, to the site if you, if you pay. And if the link allows you to get around that restriction, then the people who have access are a new public. And so there's a communication falling within the rights of the author. Now, on the hotels issue, there was a, an important case called SCF and Marco del Corso uh, in 2012, which concerned uh, the, the waiting room of a dentist. And uh, the collecting society sought a license fee from a dentist who had a radio playing in the waiting room. And the court said, well, there are only a few people in the dentist's waiting room. They come and go. So although they're members of the public, they're not, they're not really the public for these purposes. But that, of course, put in question, where do you draw the line? What is a relatively large number of people, given that we're concerned not just with what the listening audience is at any one moment, but the succession of people? And in a series of decisions, I think it's become fairly clear that it's a de minimis test that basically if you make if you make works available in general to whoever's coming and going that's the public and it's only exceptionally that uh, a general procession of people is not going to be uh, 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 the public uh, this case rehab training is about a rehabilitation facility so people who had i don't know things wrong with them were coming and sitting in the waiting room television was on treatment room television was on, the court said, yes, this, this is the public. You are making these works available, and so there's an infringement. Uh, the most recent case in 2017 concerns a hotel where the claim was by uh, a collecting society representing broadcasters. And in fact, this is only of technical interest because it turns out that the rights of, whereas the rights of authors are protected generally, um, and the rights of performers the rights of broadcasters are only protected where you pay to get in to the place where the television is located. And in a hotel, that's not the case. But I mention that for completeness. Now, the other um, way in which you can reach a new public, according to the Court of Justice, is by using a different technical means. This interesting case of, of uh, ITV broadcasting uh, was a case where 
there was an online service which streamed broadcast TV to people who were entitled to receive the signal through broadcast TV. So imagine you're, you're in England, you've got a television license, we have television licenses in England, um, you're entitled to switch on the TV and watch a film that's being broadcast. This service said, don't worry about that, we can get this to you through the internet, you can watch it on your computer, you might be somewhere else. Uh, and they, in answer to the argument, in answer to the claim that this was a communication to the public, TV catch-up, the defendant, said, well, look, there's no new public. It's all the same people. They're entitled to receive the broadcast. No new public. And the court said, no, you're sending it to them by a different means. You're sending it through the internet, not broadcasting it. And in that case, we don't worry about the, the new public restriction. They're the public. You are infringing. And a similar conclusion was come to in a recent case in November 2017 uh, about online video recorders. It was a service that was provided in the cloud. Uh, you could say to the business, oh, I'd like to record this, this particular uh, program. And they would cause that to be recorded in a cloud facility on the internet, a storage facility, which you, the user, had rented. So they weren't, the, the business was not holding a recording, it was simply facilitating the storage of a recording on cloud, a cloud server that you had rented. Was that a making available? And of course, applying the same rule, yes, of course it was. The, the internet service provider, the, the provider of the recording service, was effectively making the program available. And it was quite irrelevant whether the person was entitled to receive it uh, as a broadcast, he was receiving it in a different way. Now, in the Svensson case, which was a key decision, the journalists had authorised the appearance of the, um, their articles on the website in Sweden. The question then was, well, what about cases where people link to material that is not licensed? because there's a huge amount of it, obviously, on the internet. And the court came to the answer, or an answer, in the case of GS Media against Sonoma Media. Now, this was a case about a Dutch actress, and this lady had posed for some photographs for a magazine called Playboy, and someone managed to get copies and uploaded these photographs to a website. And Playboy... Uh, sent takedown notices, they took them down, but they kept popping up. And the defendants had a kind of gossip website, showbiz nonsense, and they provided a link to these photographs. And, of course, the defendant said, well, yeah, but everybody's got access to these photos. They're, they're already out there. There's no question of a new public. The internet knows. Um, and the court came up with a new test, and this is very important, they said that in order to establish whether the fact of posting on a website hyperlinks to protected works, which are freely available on another website without the consent of the right holder, constitutes a communication to the public, it is to be determined whether those links are provided without the pursuit of financial gain by a person who did not know and could not reasonably have known the illegal nature of the publication of those works, or whether, on the contrary, those links are provided for such a purpose, a situation in which that knowledge must be presumed. So the court said that there is no communication to the public by the posting of a link if you do not know and you could not reasonably know that the content is pirate. If you are acting commercially, you are under a duty to satisfy yourself that what you do is lawful. And so if it's a commercial operator, like the operator of the, the gossip website, then it's presumed that they know that the content is a pirate. So in this case, the website lost. Now, for copyright lawyers, this is an extraordinary decision 
because in civil proceedings, you don't have to prove any particular state of mind. The court was holding not that the website was a... The website was um, an accessory that they had incurred secondary liability. They, they, they were not the, the, the man who was driving the getaway car when the robbers are in the bank. No, according to this, the website was a primary infringer. The website was, in its own right, infringing one of the exclusive rights. And that's extraordinary. It's a kind of solution, but we'll, we'll have to see whether it holds up. Uh, I'm going to run forward to the most recent case that's relevant to this, which came out just last month. And I think it's the only copyright decision in 2018 so far. Now, this is a strange case about a school project. A school child included a photograph in the school project which she had downloaded from a travel website. It was a photograph of Cordoba in Spain. And the photographer, well, the photographer had licensed the appearance of this photograph on the travel site. Unfortunately, the school must have liked the project very much because they uploaded the project to the school's website where the photograph was visible. And perhaps in a rather ungentlemanly way, the photographer sued the um, the, the land, the, uh, the area of Germany that was responsible for the school, saying this is an infringement. You are making my work available. I have not licensed you. You must pay me. And the question then was, well, what about this new public requirement? It's on the internet. It's licensed. You have licensed it to be on the internet. So where's, where's the new public? And the court has now said, oh, well, in this case, the school made a new copy. The school was not linking to the original website. The school had copied it and put it on the internet. And in that case, even though exactly the same people have access to it, there is a communication to the public. So I think in this case, we begin to see the limitations of the original formulation. Because you might say, well, if the test is finding a new public, what difference does it make that the reproduction right was infringed? The work is the work. The reproduction right, the, the, the communication to the public right, is part of the work, not the instance, the instantiation of any particular, of the work in any particular copy. So this is, um, indicates to me that the, all this jurisprudence about communication to the public is open to question. And actually, this is a sensible decision. This is clearly right. And uh, uh, if you, in principle, if you make someone's work available on the internet, you should be liable. That, however, is not <laughs> uh, the position of WIPO. Now, I see that uh, it's uh, three minutes before half past, so I just have to see whether there's... I think I should mention one further. There's a, there is one Latvian case on enforcement... Uh, called Ranks from 2016, but I won't talk about that now. I just want to talk about um, site blocking. Now, one of the most interesting developments in remedies is the uh, blocking of websites uh, through orders that are issued to service providers. Instead of issuing an order against the infringer, which may be someone who's abroad, you can't do anything about them, you issue an order, the court issues an order against the service provider saying you must prevent people in Latvia accessing this website. The basis of that is in principle Article 8.3 of the 2001 Copyright Directive. And it's proved to be quite an effective measure uh, to reduce piracy. In the criminal sphere, you may see this kind of notice substituting for a domain. And there's research, which you can, you can see on the WIPO website, which indicates that this is, a, this is a useful measure. You may say, well, what about fundamental rights? What about the right of free expression and all the rest of it? Well, happily, the Court of Justice in 2014, in the uh, Telecarwell and Constantine film case, uh, advises that um, 
you can strike a balance between these rights. And in principle, the right of property, which is, which is protected under Article 17 of the EU Charter of Fundamental Rights, the right of intellectual property, uh, that right uh, is properly protected by an injunction against service providers so long as people who are affected by the order can come back to court and object. I suspect that never happens, but uh, in principle it could. So we can make these orders. And finally, in this context, I'd like to draw your attention to some orders that have begun to be made in relation to live sport. Now, as you know, um, the highest value, the highest interest of a sports match, uh, a football game, is while it is happening. When it's yesterday's news, it's much less interesting. And in the United Kingdom, the courts have started to issue injunctions specifically requiring the blocking of websites or web addresses during the match so that the, 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 uh, uh, the order provides that the right holders can inform the service providers on a weekly basis of particular IP addresses where they believe that there will be uh, infringing streams and the service providers block them just for the duration of the match uh, or for half an hour afterwards. In these cases, you've got the references there. They're very interesting, very flexible. And recently, according to the IPCAT, they've started to grant similar orders in Italy. I think we will see more of that. And this is just a, an example of the, the order that is made in the, in the British cases. I think at that point I should stop, since it's uh, 29 minutes to three. Uh, I don't know if there may be a chance for questions. I'm in the hands of the moderator. Thank you, Mr. Dillon, for a very interesting speech. Um, your time. Questions? Great speech. Um, I would like to ask your opinion uh, in regarding uh, um, the opinion proposed by International Literary and Artistic Association. So they believe that uh, that CGU. Uh, by developing this criteria of, uh, of uh, a new public is actually in conflict with uh, Bern Convention because there is no such a criterion there. What is your opinion on that issue? <laughs> well, as, uh, on the assumption that nobody is listening, um, I think that, that's Professor Sirinelli and co. I, I completely agree, but I mean, WIPO doesn't have a position on that. But I mean, it's clearly the effect of the doctrine is to exclude from protection at works that are made available on the internet to an old public. And there is no provision in the, in the Berne Convention which permits that. But of course, the, Bern, the extent of the Berne Convention is debatable because it's there, if I remember correctly, um, the, 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 the protection of wireless and by wire um, subject matter is limited to broadcasters, if I remember correctly. But, yeah, so, so, so whether, whether it actually, whether, for example, if I'm, a, if I'm a, a, a writer and my script is being made available, whether I really have protection on, on that point under Byrne. Certainly under the, the WIPO Copyright Treaty, I, I wouldn't have a, a problem if that's a good argument. So I probably said more than I should. <laughs> anyway. Good. Okay, and if, you may, if I may, one more question um, about the... Uh, the last case, you, I think you mentioned the Renkhoff case about this photo. Yes. Um, I myself, when I read it, uh, and um, I, I saw some inconsistency to the previous case law of uh, CGU because, well, you're right, they mentioned this argument that, um, that um, there was a copying, that's true, but also they said that uh, there was communication to the public which was not uh, taken into account by the author, which actually means that they believe that there is different public for, um, well, let's say, types of sites, of like in this case it was travel site where the original photo was communicated, and then the, some other people go to school sites. So. Uh, well, do you see this discrepancy or...? I completely agree with you. I mean, again, uh, we're not being bugged. Uh, the, uh, the problem with this is it's, entire, it's, a fi it's a fictional construction. 
it, 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 really they're, they're talking about licensing. That, that what there's, uh, it seems to me this problem is better tackled through a notion of licensing. If I put something on the internet, then in principle I'm agreeing to everybody linking to it. But that doesn't, that's a consent question. You don't have to redefine infringement to get over the problem of, of, of linking. So it seems to me if they had said, oh, well, you know, you, you, you've, in Svensson, you've agreed to the linking because you put, you put it on the internet, full stop, then you wouldn't have needed this whole business about the new public. But that, of course, comes from the television cases. So I think that this, the Renkoff case, does exactly expose the instability of the, the previous definition. So I'll come back next year and see if, tell you if anything's happened. Voila. Okay, thanks. Welcome to the